A blessed evening to all our members and friends who have joined us online for this. On a cult, a riveting study on the promises of God. First, I, I, I want to make a correction from last week. You know, my wife cornered me, right, as I was watching, watching the um, broadcast <clears throat> at home. And she, she just asked me a question. She said, who son, whose son was um, Mephibosheth? Jonathan or Saul? And I said, Jonathan's son. And she said, but that's not what you said. <laughs> I said, okay. All right, so let me make that correction, right? Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. It was Saul's grandson. That's what, what, what should have been said, all right? That, that you'd find that story in 2 Samuel 9. All right, so we continue to examine the, the conditional beneficial promise found in uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Let me read it again. Um, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All right, so we have been looking at that. And so far, we have studied two burdens that Christ came to give us rest from. Okay? First of all, we spoke of the burden of sin. And then next we spoke about the burden of guilt. And we kind of wrapped up on that last week. One final burden I want to talk about, and this is not just the sum total of the burdens that Christ came to, to bear for us and to, to um, give us rest from. It's not the sum total, but we'll be looking at a third one, all right? And this will be our final one in the, in the list. Christ wants to take away and replace with his rest the burden of Grief. The burden of grief. <clears throat> so this evening we will be looking at that in, in our study. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for Christ, who is our burden bearer. Father God, we pray, Lord, that you will teach us, Lord God, to take all our cares, all our burdens to him because he desires to free us from them and to give us his rest. Almighty God, just bless this word and Holy Spirit, pour out into the lives of those who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. There is so much grief around us, so much grief. Grief is all around us, right? Especially in today's world. The coronavirus has taken away millions of people worldwide, millions. And it is believed that the real number of deaths from COVID-19 is much more than what is stated by the official number of deaths. Eh? The official channels give us a number, but it is... <clears throat> um, way below that which is the reality, all right? And so a lot of people, people I can't even imagine the amount of people who have, who have lost their lives and those who are suffering from grief as a result of losing their, their family members, friends, and relatives. <clears throat> you see, the cold hands of death, <clears throat> and remember, death is no respecter of persons. So the cold hands of death has, has snatched away husbands from wives and wives from husbands. It has taken away children from their parents and parents from their children. And it has also, I mean, decimated the family. Family members have lost relatives. Friends have lost close friends. Um, <clears throat> and, and so there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of mourning. Maybe if you check it out, <clears throat> Most of us may know at least one person who has succumbed to COVID-19. If you check it out, right? 
we know at least one person that we can say you know that person died from covid and so grieving is all around us and the thing about grieving is that it is a heavy load for us to bear it's a heavy burden to bear grieving is not easy right a matter of fact it is so heavy that it has to be dealt with in stages as a process we talk about the stages of grief yes because if everything were if you were to um um if you were to take on all of these facets of grief at once it would floor you and so there are we call it the, the psychologist talks about the the the, the, the stages of, of grief so grieving is a process and it is a heavy burden for us to bear and grief you know the, grief is filled with complexities right there are some persons who are grieving and are crying crying bitterly and there are others who never shed a tear they never shed a tear and yet both people both persons are grieving yeah, are going through the grieving um, process and um, for some grief may be so unbearable that th that what it might do is is trigger some pre-existing conditions that people have like hypertension and they end up dead <laughs> as a result of grieving so a mother might lose a son but she has hypertension and 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 that sensor that grief that 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 stress and strain of losing that son sends her to the hospital and she gets sometimes a massive stroke and 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 she goes also so grief is not something to to smile about grief is real and grief is a heavy burden to bear but christ wants to give us rest from it he wants to you see the burden of, of of grief hit christ it hit him head on i would want to say when his friend lazarus passed away when lazarus had died christ was overcome with grief and he wept where god tells us jesus wept right even while he knew that he was about to raise lazarus from the dead and that's how powerful grief is he knew he was going to get back lazarus in um, to life again but it still it still was enough to make him cry to make him weep all right so so he understands grief he he came and he experienced that in his in his life all right so let us first look at this i want us first to understand what god's response is to our grief what is god's response to our grief all right lamentations 3 and we will look at about four verses there 31 through 33 and this is what it says it says for men are not cast off by the lord forever though he brings grief he will show compassion so great is his unfailing love for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. That is the, 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 the attitude of God and the response of God towards grief. He doesn't cast you off forever. He shows compassion. He understands grief. And he brings his love into play when we come uh, when we under uh, undergo grief or when we experience grief right so he he's he's a he's a god who he who knows who understands and who helps that's how it is right helps you see we have to suffer grief you know because of the world that we are living in the world that we are living in is not the perfect world you know? it's a world that has has been tainted by sin okay and sin brings grief it is sin that brings death that brings grief <laughs> right wages of sin is death is grief also okay so so um he understands and he is ready and willing to assist us um to go through that process 
okay, without being destroyed or consumed by our grief. If there's any human being, you know, who, who knows what grief is, it is the prophet Jeremiah. Yeah. He's called the weeping prophet, always crying, right? He, he, he wept. And, and actually, he has a book called Lamentations. He wrote that book. And Lamentations just simply mean mourning. Okay? He was in grief um, all the time. Why? Because he was the bearer of all the bad news that was going to happen to the people um, of God at the time. Right? There was going to be some serious things happening to them because of their sin, because of their rebellion and their idolatry. And he was the one, he was the purveyor, he was the one who was going to convey that news to the people. And I tell you, it wasn't very popular. It wasn't very popular. And it was a difficult for him because he identified with God's people. And when he knew what they were going to be going through, he wept. He mourned. I can't imagine him writing and crying. <laughs> right? Crying about the state of Israel and what God said, what God told him was going to happen to them as a result. All right? At one point in his life, there were some evil officials who didn't like a message that Jeremiah had given, given to them. They didn't like the message. And so they asked the permission of King Zedekiah to, to kill Jeremiah, because of the, the, what I would say now, the, it is the, the morbidity of the message. Eh? It was just a message that, that, that just never sat well with them. And so they subsequently grabbed him, put him into a muddy pit, right? And left him there to die because... You know, there was a little time of famine going on. There was a scarcity of bread and all those things. So he wouldn't get any food. And he would eventually just die from malnourishment. Or just from grief. <laughs> because you're in a situation where you're in a pit. They call it a cistern. Some, some scriptures call it. You're in a pit. You're sinking in the mud. Because the word of God tells us that Jeremiah sank in the mud. So we don't know how far in the mud he had. Something maybe he had sunk to his shoulders, to his neck, to his waist, whatever. But he's in the mud. He cannot move. He's there. And, and, and what happened? Jeremiah escaped the hands of death because of what was done by God. It was God. It was a God thing who, 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 that, that um, came to his rescue. All right, but well, you can read that account for yourselves in um, Jeremiah 38. It's in Jeremiah 38. And so Jeremiah, my point is that Jeremiah knew grief. He knew what war was. Yes, he knew sorrow. And so, so we can believe him when he declares this in Lamentations 3:31 to 33. We can believe him. When he says, when he tells us, when he wants to um, um, uh, make us understand how God relates to grief, we can believe him because he was a grieving man. And he spent his life, uh, most of his life as a prophet, grieving. And so he says that God shows compassion, right? He doesn't willingly bring it on to the children of men. But when it comes, he shows compassion he understands all right okay now the word of god gives us an understanding of grief so we're talking about god's response to our grief but the word of god gives us an understanding of grief the word of god tells us why grief why does grief um have to come and what is it about grief that god's people need to know the word of god tells us all right let's look at it first of all let's look at first peter right i will go back to that slide that says it is faith building all right and then we look at first peter one i want to look at verses six through nine in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, 
while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hmm. You see, when, 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 when we suffer grief brought about by the different circumstances that we face, when we are grief stricken in our trials, right? When, whatever trials we have, it may be death, somebody dies for us, or maybe we lose something and we're grieving over it. Any kind of loss. Huh? We must remember that our faith in God is on trial. Whenever that, those things happen, you know. Uh, so, so, so you could say, when trials face us, our faith is on trial. Right? It is our faith that is being tested. So as we grieve now, whenever these circumstances happen and we are grieving, here is where our faith comes in. Do we believe what God has said? Do we believe what God has said? Do we believe Romans 8, 28 that we looked at? When we are in this grieving process because of these trials that come around us, the word of God tells us that they come to build our faith, these trials. These trials come to make our faith become like pure gold. But do we believe this? Do we believe Romans 8, 28 that we had looked at recently? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When you believe this, when you accept this, because the only way you can accept this is by faith, when you accept this promise that God made and you believe that with your whole heart, you are settled. You don't, have, you don't have any reason to continue grieving because you know that God says everything is going to work out for good. Everything will work out for good. So you wait for it to work itself out. <laughs> For the good of you who love God. All right? And so, so, and that's why I tell you, you know, your faith is being, is, is, is under trial. Your faith is being tested whenever you have situations around you that cause you to grieve. All right? And so, 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 so do you believe that the, the promise um, that is in Lamentations um, 3, 31 to 33 you remember what he said? God brings grief, but he will show compassion. Do you believe that? Because that is a faith thing. You have to accept that by faith. So you see how these things come to sharpen your faith. So that is what the word of God wants to tell us about grief. How we should understand grief in our lives. That it is not something to floor us, but no, it is something to make our faith in God become strengthened, become honed. We hone our faith um, in God when these trials come that make us grieve. All right? Now, if we, if we believe these things, you know, we believe Romans 8, 28, we believe Lamentations 3, 31 to 33, here is what is going to happen to us. Here's the next thing that we need to understand about grief, because this will happen to us if we believe, right? For, um, grief is temporary. It is temporary, all right? And here's what Psalm 34 and 5 says. Psalm 30. Verses 4 and 5. It says, Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes 
in the morning. That is going to be your experience when you use your faith to make you get over these situations, to make you overcome your grief and you are not overcome by grief. You see, when you are overcome by grief, weeping remains. Mm -hmm. And the word of God is not telling us that that weeping will last overnight. <laughs> That's not what it's saying. Uh -uh. What it is telling us is that weeping is short-lived. It's going to be short-lived. You're not going to ball for five years. Yeah? You're not going to be weeping for the rest of your life. A time will come when your joy is restored. And who will do that? It's not you. It's not people around you. It's God who promises to restore that joy. He promises to make your rejoicing come in the morning of your situation. Huh? In the night of your situation, you know, that's the night, the night, when the night is there, that's when darkness is there, you know, right? So weeping will remain while you are in this dark state. But when the light comes upon you, that hold on there a little bit. God said all things work together for my good. God said that even though I grieve, compassion is there for me. He's sorry for me. He's, he, he, he. So when I understand that, I see the light. And that's my morning. That's when my morning comes. Right? As soon as I get to recognize that God does not want to destroy me with what is happening here. But God is going to come to my rescue. My, my night goes and my morning comes. That's why I, 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 I love for us to view that passage of scripture. Right? Well, I think that it does. You just grieve only for one day or one night. No, no, no. Uh -uh. You're going to grieve. You're going to grieve. But just remember this. As you grieve, remember what God says. Just remember what God says. Believe it with your heart and wait on God. And then you will experience the joy that comes in the, in the morning, right? Grief is a temporary state. That's what the meat and the message of this is. Grief ought to be a temporary state for God's people, right? And so these are comforting words indeed, right? More comforting than any grief counselor can give to you. Yeah. The word of God comforts us in our grief. All right? So as I say this, you know, as I talk about counselors and grief counselors and stuff, as I say this, you know, I am reminded of, of a grief-stricken Job. Remember Job? Grief. Everything. Lost everything. is Ten children. So he was in grief. Terrible grief. And he had some friends who came to look for him. They stopped by to help him to bear the burden of his grief. All right? Good. Good intentions. And for, for one week, seven days and seven nights, they sat with Job. They sat with Job. Nobody said a word. Everybody was quiet as Job grieved. They just sat there supporting him silently. You know, when they undid everything, when they opened their mouths. As soon as they opened their mouths, everything was undone. They actually made Job's grief become heavier. It became heavier. It became, it became harder to bear. And that was courtesy of his friends. You see, there's a lesson in that for us, you know. Yeah, when we encounter someone in grief, they have lost someone or, 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 or they have lost whatever it is. Maybe they lose their home in a, in a, in a um, hurricane or something, but, or a fire, and they are encountering grief. Talk less and feel more. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see, if you speak, if you are going to speak, you, are, you have to use God's words to encourage the person. Yeah, use what God says. Use it to encourage and not to disparage. Because the friends use the word of God, but they use it against Job. 
I used it to tell Job, Job, you are a sinner, is a sin, a sin. And God's word says this about the sinner. Use the word of God, as I said, to encourage and not to disparage. All right? Okay. Now, here's what Job, I, I, I found this interesting because I saw what Job had to say about them and to them. All right? This is what Job said to them. In Job 6, 14 and 15, I call it 15. 15a because it's just a piece of it i'm going to take a dis despairing man sorry a despairing man should have the devotion of his friends even though he forsakes the fear of the almighty but my brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams so he said about them he said that to their face he told them and this is what he said again in job 13 4 and 5 he says you, however, smear me with lies. You are all worthless physicians. All of you. If only you would be all together silent. You see, he's telling them, go back to the farmer's state where you were. You were silent for seven days. Keep silent. For you, that would be wisdom. <laughs> Job was hard on them. Hard on them. All right? If you did shut your mouth, that's all he's saying. If you had shut your mouth, Right? You wouldn't have made my grief become so hard to bear. Right? You come here saying that you're going to bear my grief. And you're just telling me, oh, oh, I am guilty. I am guilty. And I know I'm not guilty. So, so, so yes. All right? Grief is always a heavy burden to bear. But Christ wants to bear it for us. Why? Why does Christ want to bear our grief for us? I want to say, first of all, Christ understands our grief. Remember, I told you before that he had his moments of grief yeah, with Lazarus. Yeah? But that's not all. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4 says it. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering i like how the king james put it the king james says acquainted with grief right like one from whom men hid hide their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not so he was the man of grief right he was the man of grief surely he had borne our griefs. Surely he had done it. Born our sorrows. Carried our sorrows. Yeah. That's what Isaiah says. So he experienced grief at Lazarus' death, as we pointed out earlier. But then he suffered grief like, like none other before him. And I don't think there's anyone after him who suffered that. And I can put um, that down and saying that, that that's as good as money in the bank. Nobody ever suffered like him before or after. Why? Because no one else carried the sins of the world. Nobody else. He was the only one who did that. So I can safely say that there were, he had no equal in his grief. No equal. Right, And he still has none and he will never have any equal in his grief because there will be no other savior except him. All right. So, so, so he, was, he suffered grief like, like none other when he bore our sins. Right? Luke records that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so overcome that his strength failed him. Luke says it, right? Going to Mount of Olives with God of Gethsemane is. He says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, as the, the, the garden, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish. Yeah, that's grief. That's what grief does to you. It holds you in the grip of anguish. Really sorrowful. 
really burdened down, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The, 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 the medical um, personnel say that that is a possibility. That's a medical possibility. But it's rare. It's rare. It's a phenomenon that is very rare because you'd have to be under extreme duress, stress for something like that to happen to a person, for your blood to mingle with your sweat. Right? And so, so, so that's what happened to him. Right? That's what happened to him. So um, um, grief, grief was burdening, burdening down Christ in such a way that we can only imagine. We can only imagine it, right? Here's what Mark's account says. Mark in, in, um, said this in Mark 14, 32 through 34. He went to a place called Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You see, is it a type of grief? Overwhelmed with grief to the point of death. This is a man who understands grief. He went through it. You want to say he bought the t-shirt? <laughs> yeah, he went through grief. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. So Christ understands our grief. He understands it. And look at our final scripture as I close. Hebrews 4 and, and verses 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest. After it speaks in the verse before of Jesus being our high priest. It says we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet without sin. It says now let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need hmm. you know what this is reminding us of this is reminding us of jesus's humanity he was man he underwent all that we in our life can ever undergo mm -hmm. do we need mercy and grace when we have grief grief do we need mercy and grace of course we need mercy we need God to, 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 to be merciful to us and to come to our rescue. And he will do it. You see, when we are grieving, you know, uh, Brameli, sometimes in grief, you know, you hear people say, Lord of mercy. Lord of mercy upon me. What are they calling for? Mercy. You see, so we need mercy in our times of grief right and god provides mercy by sparing us from the ravages of grief yes and gives us grace to provide us with rest from the burden of grief we don't deserve that right? we should, grief should consume us but he gives us rest from it right and that gives us hope that we have a burden bearer who is on our side he's on our side he's with us okay so next week god's willing we will look at the condition now the condition that christ sets so that we are able to access that rest that only he can provide soul rest rest for the soul and so god bless you all and thanks for tuning in and have a great rest of the week bye-bye